Welcome to today's lecture about species distribution modeling. We're going to look at grizzly bears in Montana, USA, and mountain hares in the Peak District of England. So what is a species distribution model? Well, essentially, it is a predictive map which shows where an animal or a plant ranges across a landscape, how it's distributed. So it uses historic or current records of where the animal or plant is, compares those locations with environmental characteristics, such as rainfall, snow, or temperature, cold or warmth, is it cold or warm there? Also looks at topography, elevation, and vegetation, human influences, are there towns there, agriculture or roads, combines all that environmental information and compares those with the records of that species and uses sophisticated statistics to create a map, a distribution map of where that animal or plant is likely to be found. Very well described in this lovely book, in fact, my favorite book, textbook of all time, Habitat Suitability and Distribution Models by Geyser. So let's look at the species distribution model for grizzly bears in the Cabinet Yak ecosystem, 4,000 square kilometers of beautiful forest and mountains in Montana, USA. Here there are 45 grizzly bears, critically endangered, so much so that they need conserving and the state agencies, the government agencies, need to know where those bears are likely to be found. So how do they do that? Well, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, they GPS collar one or two grizzly bears each year, capture and collar them. That bear is released into the forest and the GPS emits locations and those can be plotted against topography, so one sees that grizzly bears like southern slopes because it's sunny. And they also like, on the satellite map, these purple areas, which is where huckleberries are, the major food resource for grizzly bears in July and August, where they sit on huckleberry patches all the day long feeding. So with this information, locations and topography and huckleberry maps, United States Fish and Wildlife Service create a predictive map which shows these dark green areas. Those are high elevation areas with high probability of seeing a grizzly bear. Yellow is lower probability of, of a grizzly bear being present. It's lower down in the valleys. How would one use this information? Well, perhaps with this knowledge, we can think about how we share the land with grizzly bears and restrict some of the human activities that may adversely affect them, such as we might limit road densities, or we might choose to encourage tourists not to go on tourist trails high up during the summer so that they avoid grizzly bear encounters. And if a company wants to start a forestry or a mining operation in the middle of the mountains, we can suggest to them where they might not want to be, which might adversely affect grizzly bears. So now let's look at another species distribution model that I developed with some friends in Manchester, looking at the European brown hare and particularly the mountain hare in the Peak District. How could we develop such a map of where mountain hares occur? It's a large area of 800 square kilometers there's only about two or 3,000 mountain hares there. So one way of doing this is to retrieve records from biological record centers, such as Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. And we accumulated these for several years and plotted where mountain hares were. And you can see the numbers seem to surge and decline, surge and then start to decline again. Why is that? And can we use just one year's data? It's tricky. It may be that there are ecological factors causing their numbers to surge, such as their prolific breeders, 
and they might decline on occasions because of parasites. More likely it is the number of people out recording mountain hares vary from year to year. So we chose to use 20 years of data, eight and a half thousand records. You can see that people are walking along the ridge line, the main tourist paths. There are lots of mountain hare records, probably accentuated in some locations. So we selected one record per hectare to say, is it a presence point? And that thinned things down to 1,690 records. Then for absences, we go to places such as Millbrook here, where there's been no mountain hares seen in 20 years. And we ask the computer to randomly set, select 1,690 locations. And then we take that location data and we can compare it to environmental information. So here for the year 2020, we have this map called Bio 6 mean winter temperature. It shows that the temperature at Bleakloe Summit at 630 metres is cold, it's minus two. Mountain hares occur there because they're physically, physio physiologically adapted to snow. Their fur turns white in winter, it insulates them, they're camouflaged against the snow, they love it. At Back Tor, here at 530 metres, it's also cold, there are mountain hares. But here down at Middlemore, it's warmer and there are no mountain hares. So we now have presence and absence data of environmental characteristics. We can feed this into a predictive model, a logistic regression. This shows on the x-axis, when you have minus two degrees, you have a high likelihood probability on the y-axis of a mountain hare appearing. Whereas here, when it's warmer towards zero degrees, the probability of a mountain hare occurring is much lower. We have several lines here because we've run the model several times with different selections of absence data. We can also use other types of statistical analysis. This predictive model therefore shows that in the Peak District, mountain hares range over 160 square kilometres. That's in the year 2020. What happens under climate change? Well, remember our model came from this year 2020 data for climate. Now the mean winter temperature for year 2050 is going to be four degrees warmer. And so we use this model that we have and compare it with the locations to say, where will mountain hares be? Previously, for the year 2020, it was 160 square kilometres. And now we have, for the year 2050, it, the range has contracted. At Bleaklow, it's zero degrees. There are still a few mountain hares there. But at Back Tor, it's different now. It's two degrees. Those mountain hares that we used to see have now disappeared. And at Middlemore, there are still no hares. So overall, a range contraction. To create this model, we used not only Bio6, but a number of other ways of defining the climate for different times of the year, rainfall and temperature. So we had six logistic regressions for mountain hare, and we also did it for brown hare as well. They are a sister species. They migrated here from Central Asia, from the steppes of Central Asia, where it's warmer. And because of that, we know they're physiologically adapted to warmer temperatures, and they're going to encompass the Peak District. So we have this conundrum, mountain hares and brown hares moving in opposite directions. What can we do about that? Is there anything we can do? Well, maybe those areas where mountain hares will eventually hang out their strongholds, we can designate some protections or improve the habitat quality. What we really ought to do is monitor both species because they are likely to compete with each other for resource. And sometimes they hybridize with each other, which could mean the elimination of the mountain hare. Whatever we do, we must 
act in the interest of both species. So that, in, that concludes the description of species distribution models. There are more resources here, videos, a free book, courses that you can visit. If you like the mountain hare story, this is the paper that describes it in detail. Thank you so much for watching. There will be more on my YouTube channel, Conservation Biology Lectures, so please stay tuned.